All right. We are live on YouTube. Dr. Brian Keating, Dr. Eric Weinstein. How are you, my friend? I miss you very much. And I you, sir. Good to be with you. It's good. Is it Cinco de Mayo? Yes. Feliz Cinco de Mayo. It always comes on the 5th of May every freaking year. It's like clockwork. Well, I've decided to celebrate and be festive. Oh, you've got uh, five glasses of tequila like me? No, I've got the Mexican hat potential. Oh. On the bottom of my mug. Well played, sir. Buenos dias to you, my friend. Well, we're going to get in uh, right off the bat. We're going to talk about the most exciting subjects in your universe. My audience has missed you uh, as much as I have. <clears throat> and uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, we kind of give, uh, give the people what they're interested in. And that today involves a whole host of, of, of issues. We're going to talk about aliens and a possible new solution to the Fermi paradox. We're going to talk about uh, your new and ever-evolving, in a good way, uh, theories and feelings about cryptocurrencies, inflation, and so forth. And then we're going to talk about uh, some less controversial subjects like abortion, Supreme Court leaks, um, <clears throat> and uh, wherever the day takes us. So, How exciting. I, yes, and I was pleased... Yeah. Uh, Pleased to see uh, recently a man by the name of Musk uh, has has kind of uh, taken a new stance for which he's ex taking extreme attacks and hostility. And I wondered, Eric, you know, if he might have a little bit of buyer's remorse right now. Do you feel like this prize, you know, everyone's, oh, he's the richest man in the world. That's true. He has five times this amount. That's true. But, you know, if I, t if I you know, took away your, your family car, uh, you would feel it. Uh, you know, I would feel it. And so I feel like this is a tremendous amount of money. And I want to take you back to uh, uh, we started pandemic podcasting together two years ago. Exactly. So, uh, you know, congratulations on our anniversary. But um, in the in between, there was this thing called Clubhouse. I don't know if you remember this thing called Clubhouse. And that was the hottest ticket in the world. Everybody wanted it and get on it. I haven't used it in months. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, like I said, I don't know. You might be on there, but I'm not on there. Um, do you think he might be having buyer's remorse? Do you think he might look back and say this was the clubhouse of 2022 uh, eventually and I shouldn't have given up a quarter of my net worth? Um, if there is buyer's remorse, my guess is that it hasn't set in yet because I believe that there's so, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to improve Twitter. And, you know, e Elon, I don't know Elon at all. Uh, I know tons of people who know him. Um, my impression of him from afar is very confused. He does seem to be in many ways, the world's most forward thinking person. Um, at least at the level of, you know, forward thinking, what can we, what can we actually do? Uh, so I, I'm pretty impressed with him intellectually as a public mm -hmm. intellectual. And then, you know, then there are layers. Then there's the idea that he has to be chaotic. So he is very Trump-like in many ways in terms of how he uses Twitter and how he attempts not to be constrained because, you know, there are going to be SEC rules and lots of lawyers and PR people telling him, you can't say this, you can't do that. And he's decided that he wants to be free. And so there's this paradox, sort of a, a laugher curve. When you have no money and when you have lots of money, you tend to be in a weird way less free than people with intermediate levels. And so in a strange way, I sort of see him as a very rich person choosing to put a lot of his wealth at risk so that he can be free. And that too is very forward thinking. Now, what I know about Twitter is that current Twitter has all sorts of obviously soluble problems in terms of you can just fire a bunch of people and you can make rules about algorithmic um, transparency and the like. And then when you get to the end of plucking all the low hanging fruit, then you've got the problem of the underlying technology allows any person to post something instantly. And, you know, what we've seen is we've seen first person shooters uh, looking like they come out of a video game uh, in the Christchurch mosque massacre uh, that was, I think, streamed live on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So th the problem is us. It's not Twitter. It's not the technology. It's the the technology hooked up lots of people, many of whom have mental health issues, many of whom uh, are incredibly chaotic, um, talking to each other without common background, without 
an ability to you know to know who's going to post what when. So, in that world, I don't think there's a solution. So, you know, the great danger is is that he's bought something and he's got the first seventeen fixes lined up, <laughs> and. Uh, I don't think the problem is going to occur then. I think the problem is going to occur once you fixed all of those things, what are you left with? And, you know, one, one of the things he's signaled, Brian, is that he believes that removing anonymity will be a large portion of the solution. And I do think it will do a lot to solve the problems of Twitter. But there's a hard core of people who are happy to be known who are incredibly abusive and think it's funny. And then there's a very large market for abuse. And I think people haven't really realized that, that abuse tends to be one of the most important products that the internet knows how to distribute. And because you can't sign up for abuse, you can't say, hey, I want to see who's abusing who today. I'm feeling like I should abuse somebody else. I'm not feeling so good about myself. When you do that, you realize you can't be honest that you're really up for going to the Coliseum to see people get hurt. You're really starting to say, Oh no, no, no. Uh, I'm here for the comedy. It's just comedy. It's just fun. It's just laughs. Or, um, I think this makes the world a better place. I'm calling people out who are ghoulish and horrible. Well, no, you're really just up for abuse and you don't have many ideas and your life is empty and, and that's what you're doing. Well, okay. That problem of all sorts of people selling this one product that has an enormous audience for it uh, is going to plague Twitter. So I think that there is buyer's remorse, um, but I think Elon can go make more money. What he's trying to do is he's trying to say, we, we have to have some property that isn't in control under the, con well, how do I say this? You have to have some major property it isn't under the control of whatever this wrong woke thing is. And you, you know, you have Fox and you have, um, I don't know, N Newsmax, but Truth these are not, mm -hmm. <laughs> these are not major or, you know, e even the blaze or, 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 uh, or the daily wire or the daily caller, any, any of these things, I think, they're not like MSNBC, New York Times, NPR. And the fact that all of these sort of form, formerly, formerly um, respectable properties gone completely insane, uh, haven't broken rank, buying one and saying, hey, we, we're not gonna change the, the, the logo and we're not gonna change the, mast, uh, the masthead completely. But what we are going to do is we are going to stop making it possible to be ridiculous in this coordinated assault on reality. Now, that's why everybody on the, and it's not the left, Brian, it's like the, it's some sort of a partnership between the establishment left and their revolutionary army um, that they deploy to try to undo everything that gets in the in the path of what I would call the rent seeking elite who are in control of the Democratic Party. Um, that that thing, he's taking that on. And I think you have to look at it. He's not taking it on necessarily from being a conservative. He's taking it on from saying, I can't live under these people one second longer. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, looking back at, you know, the history of these platforms, I mean, we see Facebook kind of falling out of favor, and, and we saw the massive contributions in the previous election election by Zuckerberg, which didn't curry him any favor with the, the people that uh, obviously he was advocating for. So I, I wonder, you know, in this, and, and I wonder if you saw any of the interviews that Zuckerberg's been on this, you know, kind of world tour lately uh, <clears throat> on Lex's show and on um, another podcast, uh, oh, Tim Ferriss. Uh, and, and no one's really asking him, you know, these the, the really tough questions. Uh, so I wonder, you know, is it is it really true that we we look to these um, we look to these people as if they're uh, so lucky to have the resources to buy this? Uh, it seems to me like a nightmare hellscape to to wake up in the morning and have a New York Times hit piece like Elon faces today with his uh, South African childhood brought into play as if he had choices to where oh, he was born. Jeez. 
I just, why don't you just call everything white supremacist? You know, just, just, just get it over with. Everybody's a Nazi. Everybody's a white. Right. Why? They just waste our time because the New York Times used to be an important newspaper and, and still capable of, yeah. of doing things. I said so. um, we all have to have a discussion framed by them. And my feeling is, okay, let's just take some random person, you know, let, let, let's take, uh, um, just give, give me a generic Republican. Uh, uh, Marco Rubio. Okay, Marco Rubio. Is there any truth to the fact that he was connected to the Cuban, Cuban mafia? Okay, now we're going to discuss Marco Rubio being connected to the Cuban mafia for no reason other than the fact that somebody was able to put that question in a sentence uh, at the top of, of an article. So my feeling is we could also, um, why does Marco Rubio uh, seemingly target America's children? Oh, is he targeting America's children? Like we just changed from the Cuban mafia to some different story. Um, I think we've got to just stop, start with the idea of shut up. Mm. Like you don't, if you don't have much, Hush. That's where I feel like, you know, this this takeover of Twitter, he took over something which is built by people that had an ideological bent against him and have a very clear perspective on what they want to promote and what they don't want to promote and and highlight versus not. And uh, I feel like again, I feel like it's like a booby prize. I, I do feel like at some point even I or you, you know, would wake up and just say, you know, like there's so much richness in the world. Like uh, who cares to have these battles with people that only get points, the more polarized that they speak, the more they try to punch up and take down Eric Weinstein. I get, I get like those dr dungeons. Remember that dungeons and dragons, you know, hit points. If I take Eric's yeah, car, sure. you know, I get your hit points. Well, you've got 690,000 people that follow. Oh, I've only got, who gives a freaking crap? <laughs> you know I mean? All these people do remarkably well and uh, with, without it. And, and I feel like he's catering to this, tribe of maybe a hundred thousand semi-woke you know if you want to call it that uh, journalists people in the beltway and, and the corridor in the northeast and then the west Coast. and why do you want to spend so much of your i mean again it's a fifth brian, brian brian i don't know what you're asking about the key issue is we've got to buy one of these things there has to be a university that's actually a university a news service that's actually a news service a place a, a public square that's a public square like we've lost everything essentially. And, and then there's these false equivalents. Oh, no, 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 Fox. And it's right. like, look, Fox, I still treat as right wing propaganda. The, the major issue is, is that left leaning properties went insane as opposed to merely biased. And, you know, like there, there's one of these things with, um, hey, remember we told you that ivermectin was horse dewormer and that you shouldn't take it? Well, it turns out that if we lose Roe v. Wade, a horse ulcer medication can be used to induce uh, off-label of spontaneous abortions Abortion, in humans. Yeah. That's so just go to your vet, you're covered. And I'm thinking, okay, I really appreciate that. What you're really doing is telling me that you have the right to contradict yourselves and the rest of us are all hypocrites for simply trying to get through a day. But you have an absolute right to say whatever you want, whenever you want. That, it's a game. And, and I have to admit, I, I have caught people chuckling like, hey, did you see what I just put out today? That'll bend their minds because it contradicts what I said three weeks ago. You're just thinking, okay, I get it. Everybody's joyriding. Right. Yeah. All right. You get those, uh, get those adrenaline bumps. And, and then speaking of that, you know, this, this thing, I don't know if the deal is actually done or, or what it is, but you know, obviously a lot of it was leaked ahead of time and, and so forth. And, and you have this, like, it's like the fifth estate now. So, so you have the fourth estate, which is media. And then there's like this, this leakage class, you know, <laughs> the, the people beyond the, uh, beyond the curtain that will leak the story that eventually does get pipelined directly into the mainstream veins of, of the fourth estate of journalism. And what do you make of this? I mean, this, people are celebrating as heroes this leak, uh, you know, to the to the from the Supreme Court decision, which, as I understand it, could put people's lives in danger. Right? I don't want to be too specific, but this 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 thing is not settled law yet. And remark, regardless of how you feel about it, um, and I can hear opinions on on both sides. Uh, before I actually before I get to that, Eric, about two years ago on the portal, you did this wonderful kind of verbal essay. 
and everybody's asking when the portal is going to come back. I, I hope it'll be soon. No, no uh, questions asked about that today. But <clears throat> you did a you did a wonderful uh, verbal essay in which you talked about the trouble with ambiguity, and you talked about superpositions and how um, inharmonious they are for the human mind. And the human mind hates uh, ambiguity and loves resolution, even if the resolution's wrong. And you talked about abortion. You talked about gun control. I wonder, could you recapitulate that discussion? It was in the context of, you know, kind of a Schrodinger state uh, of a baby being real versus not. Have you changed your opinions? And can you first recap, uh, or can you recount that, that, that wonderful kind of analogy that you used? Uh, well, I, yeah, of course, I, I should listen to the portal and find out what I, what I said or thought. Um, <laughs> You know, my yeah, usual sorry to take bring your own it. words on you. You remember that Charles Barkley said he was he was taken out of context in his own autobiography. So we're not in bad <laughs> company. Funny. Well, you know, the, the famous um, description of one of my favorite classical music pieces, Saint-Saëns' Second Piano Concerto, is that it begins with Bach and ends with Offenbach. And conception, you know, it begins... Uh, when you're talking about terminating a pregnancy, it, it sort of begins with spermicide and ends in infanticide. And anything that has that property of being on a continuum that connects something incredibly trivial to something unthinkable, but naturally, you know, through the intermediate value theorem, um, <laughs> there's got to be some point where that thing becomes a meaningful life. And the political expediency has said, we're going to turn this into an intellectual football, right? And so yeah. um, one side is going to pretend that something is a baby the instant the uh, sperm uh, nudges close to the egg. And somebody else is going to pretend that it's just the mother's body uh, four seconds before delivery. Um, okay, well, there's a black hole that I don't want to get into because... What they're really saying is we know that we've got to make this wrong statement uh, in order to get where we need to go. And if you won't make the wrong statement with, with us, you're Hitler. It's like, okay, so add Hitler to white supremacist. It's just, look, Brian, this is all so dumb. It's so enervating. I mean, the real issue is we should go back to reading Griswold, uh, you know, before Roe, where we get the penumbra argument. Uh, I think it's advanced by William O. Douglas in the Warren Court. And we should ask ourselves, how sophisticated is that decision? And then, you know, the issue with Roe, uh, uh, of course, is that for its time, there was no plan B uh, back in that day. The, the world was a very different place. Um, you know, there are arguments in all different directions. I don't want to get into any of that because right. the, the issue, you know, suffice it to say, I behave pretty much as a pro-choice person early on in, a, in the pregnancy. And I've, you know, protested in the streets uh, in order to make sure that women have uh, safe legal access uh, to disposing of their pregnancies early on. Uh, and I'm pretty pro uh, baby's rights right before, you know, somebody's about to give birth. And that means I can't go to anybody's party. Yeah, I mean, uh, I remember my dad of uh, blessed memory. He used to joke, you know, on my 33rd birthday, he said, I believe in uh, abortion up until the 99th trimester. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but now it's not a joke. Uh, I mean, you have people that, that are effectively saying, you know, such things as, uh, you know, a pregnant person. Of course, we have to be respectful. It's amazing how we went from we can't define what a woman is un with regard to the Supreme Court. Right. Immediately. I'm stop you. I, I value your time and my time. And we can get into like trans. What are they thinking? Or do you know what someone's always been accused of next? And my feeling is this is my only time on this planet. And I have, you know, an esteemed physicist colleague, a worldly guy. I don't want to talk about any of the ridiculously stupid stuff that everybody wants us to talk about. So, all right. Well, thanks for joining the Into the Impossible podcast. With my it's been a pleasure, and uh, please visit like, Brian's comment, no, and subscribe. Okay. No, women, women get pregnant and give birth, and we should call some number of biological men women. Uh, I think uh, because th there is a programming issue, but this has gotten out of hand, and I'm not going to sort it out with you on this particular program. And we haven't lost our mind, and I'm not going to throw biology out the window because, you know, 
Renee Richards is, is, you know, is, is upset. We have to be compassionate and deal with everybody in our society. We should be kind and we can't lose our minds at the same time. And we failed and we failed to have these discussions. We failed to talk about the real, the reality of pregnancy. We won't sit down with Carnegie stages and embryonic development and say, when does the neural tube and the neural crest form and what is the richness of neural activity and all these kind of things that matter to me. Instead, we're going to um, try to talk to each other. Pro-life, no pro-choice, no pro-life. Let's let somebody else do it. Mm. <clears throat> all right. Well, let's pivot to another existential crisis. Which well, is... no, no, no. Oh, okay. I want to get to the leak. All right. Yes. I want to talk about the leak. Okay. Let's go back to that. Yeah. Um. I think it's important. I, I just had a conversation with somebody I've known a very long time was a lawyer last night. Mm -hmm. And the lawyer said, you know, it's wrong to leak. And I probably would have considered it. Hmm. And I said, why? <clears throat> said, oh, because uh, I think it's so important that women have uh, access to reproductive rights that even the unthinkable should be done. Hmm. Okay. okay. Um, I appreciated the candor. I think that's insane. I mean, I think that what's really becoming very clear is that very few of us trust democracy, trust the court, trust our scientists. The level of um, loss of trust has led to a large number of us unwilling to carry the culture of the United States that animates the Constitution and its other governing documents. I think this is something I don't know how to communicate. If you don't carry the culture of the United States, which is that you're willing to believe in a fiction that nine druids can discern the, the meaning of the Constitution and, and legal conflict, which is, I'm going to say it right here, it's a fiction. But I agree to that fiction. Mm -hmm. I agree to the fiction that a majority of the electoral college or one day maybe the electorate has the wisdom, the best wisdom available to choose the president, blah, blah, blah. I think many of us have decided that they don't feel, we don't feel like carrying the culture. And without the culture, it's a piece of parchment with ink. There's nothing more. If you can't animate the document, if, you, if you're unwilling to pretend to believe in the things that are necessary to keep the experiment running. Because it's like, no, with Merrick Garland, they, that's out the window. No, with Bork, you know, it's ridiculous. No, 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 you don't understand. The, the activism on the Warren court destroyed the... Okay, look, I'm, I know all of the right-wing complaints about the left and the judiciary, and I know all of the complaints uh, in reverse. And there's two separate stories. And I'm like, I feel like I'm the middle child. It's like, you idiots are going to lose us everything. Oh, you want to pack the court. Oh, you want to do this. Are you want okay. The filibuster, right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We're not going to survive this, you morons. And, you know, my feeling about this is I, the, my desire to watch Joe Biden, Donald Trump, all of these, these people are not going to be around for that long. My kids have a lot of runtime left. I, I just worry that what we haven't realized is that a giant chunk of both parties have gone revolutionary. They don't believe in the country anymore. How does that bode for the rema remainder of the union of these states then? Um, I think we don't realize what we're doing. You know, I have this memory of being on a school bus when I was a little kid and figuring out that if I could get the kids to sway back and forth in unison, we could actually have a large effect in aggregate. And we started swaying the bus and the bus was really like rocking at some incredible level just from all of these kids going back and forth. And once they figured out that this was real, they got more and more enthusiastic. And it felt like we were pretty close to being in danger of actually getting the bus to do something it wasn't supposed to do. Now, I feel like that's what we're doing, is, is that we have this idea that the bus represents like adulthood. There's nothing you can do to take down the United States of America. It's some super stable superpower. You can mouth off. It's not true. 
we are now in danger of disassembling this beautiful experiment because we're bored <laughs> and we're like mischievous and we want to have fun. So maybe we'll riot the streets this summer. Summer's coming up. Always a good idea to have mostly peaceful gatherings and we can uh, call each other names and bring some guns and then we can discuss who shot whom. Um, I think you, you ever... You've, you've got like more kids than I can remember. You probably have the same number as the last time we spoke, but I'm not even positive of that. Yeah, no, no, no abortions. Or, you know, you, or, you know or, this or line pregnancy. in Maurice Sendex, Where the Wild Things Are? He says, let the wild rumpus start. Start. Yeah. It's called, I think that's it. It's called this is the wild time. rumpus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, you know, I think that's, brings a, you know... Oh, yeah, since we talked last in late uh, December, uh, we, we did record about a month ago. We may re release that at some point. But uh, we've had this, um, obviously, this existential crisis looming in, the, uh, in Eastern Europe. <clears throat> and I wonder, you know, if we can uh, kind of think about that, that, that rumpus governed by the same clan of people you just talked about with the addition of somebody who brings the average age of the discussants down slightly to you know closer to 70 the vladimir putin uh who i, I understand he's he's not well i, I believe he is uh, undergoing some surgery so uh i don't know if if, if people uh, uh are, are going to send thoughts and prayers to that particular individual but um but you know now now things are getting serious and i remember not too long ago you advocated for something and i was like he can't be serious my god he can't be serious and that was for a demonstration event of the awesomeness of the release uh, of of the binding energy between nucleons, and, mm -hmm. and and that was a call to, you know, a demonstration of the of the of the fearful power of the wildest rumpus of all, which is nuclear thermonuclear um, uh, weapons. And you advocated for a non radioactive, but but still thermonuclear. Um, detonation, so to speak, of uh, uh, of the kind that we could witness, obviously not on catastrophic scale. But I wonder what was – at first I was shocked. I thought, uh, Eric's being a provocateur. What's the thinking behind that? What would that do for humanity to see such a thing? You, you can see for yourself. We've lost our fear of the sun. We can create what the sun does on Earth, and we're not afraid of it anymore. Look, I can't easily talk about Ukraine at the moment because I am so isolated from the rest of you all. I, if I start talking about this, it becomes very clear that they're really, we're distracting ourselves with everything else. And so I, I understand that we've decided to distract ourselves, to not take this seriously, to trifle with Armageddon and to have fun with it. We've got a handsome Jewish guy who loves his wife with one of the great lines of all time. You know what the line is? Uh, I, I need like ammunition, it. not a ride. <laughs> right? And so it's like, oh my God, nobody's, nobody's ever done anything that masculine and I'm, I'm kind of excited. Right. It's like, okay, so now we're going to have a planet that is coked up on the testosterone, testosterone of uh, Ukraine's head of state. And we're going to trifle with Armageddon as if this is fun or okay. Or, hey, let's redo the early part of the 20th century before we had the nuclear weapon. And my assessment is that it is more likely that you are all sane and that I am insane because of the odds. But I think it's the reverse. I think when I called for a return to above ground nuclear testing, I saw that the Cold War wasn't over. And I saw a world of people whose brains have been restructured by their phone. Like, I'll just give you something from Miami. I was in Miami. It was at a wonderful dinner. Mm -hmm. Very successful guy. Picked up the tab. But when the topic came up, he said, you know, the thing about all-out nuclear war is I'm not really worried about all-out nuclear war. I'm worried about reestablishing credibility in the markets afterwards. Yeah. And I thought, got it. We're, we're, we're not, I'm not in the same conversation. So I think that to be, to be blunt about it, 
Um, I've gone crazy and I'm, I'm telling you how important above ground nuclear testing with radiation. Um, you know, a lot of the radiation, the permanent radiation comes from the, the, the I guess the, the fission reaction that is turned into the fusion reaction, thanks to the geometry of Teller and Ulam. And I think that it is a question of self-preservation. I think you cannot have this many people um, completely, oh, I've gone crazy. I believe that we are trifling with Armageddon. And if we get onto this topic, I will just sound like the most um, unbalanced person you've heard. Well, I don't think so. And here's the reason why. Um, if we look at the, uh, the writings of our mutual friend, David Kaiser, the Germenschenhausen professor, at MIT of Science Technology Studies, a good friend, truly uh, a wonderful individual. He wrote a book about uh, the quantum legacy, I think it's called, and it's about kind of twin nuclei in your language, but but more not the biological nuclei, but but sort of the the co contemporaneous development of nuclear weapons, of space travel, and of the interest in aliens and uh, events like Roswell and so forth. That that wasn't coincidental. That they were all sort of um, uh, synergistically related, <clears throat> and it wasn't purely serendipitous. And his claim, I think, is now being taken up as one of the um, one of the possible explanations of Fermi's paradox. So I'm going to ask you first to define Fermi's paradox, and then I'm going to read this paper, uh, which is behind a paywall, but I, I'm going to give value to my audience. So on this channel, we do nothing if not give value. And this is going to be a, um, a website, which you will thank me for in your dreams, and it gets you over paywalls. Uh, I will reveal that in just a minute, so stay tuned for that. Uh, that's what we call foreshadowing in the business area. Um, first of all, what is the Fermi paradox? Uh, is, is it significant? Does it rise to the level of the twin paradox, of, the, uh, of Zeno's paradox, uh, or is it uh, merely a stepping stone into a bigger series of questions? Fermi paradox, please. Well, I would rather hear it from an astrophysicist. Fine, than, uh... there happens to be one right here. So Fermi did the calculation, even back in the 50s, of how many uh, stars there were, how, many, how likely it was to have uh, life in other planets, sort of precursor to what's called the Drake equation. And he came up with this estimate based on the very large number of stars known in the Milky Way galaxy, even at that point, not taking into account galaxies outside of the Milky Way. And he said the overwhelming odds are that there are uh, other civilizations, other aliens. Um, and so he asked uh, in one of these questions after the calculations that he was famous for, the so-called Fermi calculations, he said, where are they? You know, if the odds are there's tremendous numbers of these uh, civilizations of advanced extraterrestrial technology, capable species, not slime mold, um, you know. Oh, by the way, Eric, you know, I, I, I wanted to ask this of my friends on Twitter, but I, I'm too scared to ask it. So I'll ask it of you. If we found an embryo, like a human fetus, you know, let's say it's a three months development gestation and it's on the planet, you know, Procyon B, you know, Trappist 1. Uh, what do you think the, the, these, the community of astronomers would do? <laughs> I mean, would they say, ah, it's nothing, you know, let's, it's, let's abort it. <laughs> I mean, is that, a, is that an interesting litmus test to you of, of how we would react if we saw a fetus? Whatever age you want to say, 10 days, 20 days, it has a heartbeat. It's just sitting there on some planet in some exosolar planet. Uh, is that relevant to the conversation of abortion at all? I, I don't even know. It's like a Boltzmann brain, but it's a Boltzmann <laughs> fetus. It's a Boltzmann fetus. Okay. A Fermi um, fetus. Brian, whatever you're smoking, you have not sent me any of it. Uh, I did see an <laughs> enormous are... mushroom the other day that on, on your channel. Yes. And uh, this is an exciting new direction for middle-aged ne Never lick the mushroom. Never lick okay. the mushroom. Okay. Um, look, we seem to be very afraid to believe. And... You know, let, let me just get over the hump. I don't believe we're the only life in the universe. I don't know how common or how uh, rare it is. I don't know whether or not there are ways of evading. I don't know whether Einstein's restrictions pass through to all successor theories to relativity. Um, you know, Einstein may have done something to Newton, but he didn't do everything to Newton's conservation laws. 
you know, properly understood. So we don't know what the source of our apparent aloneness is. But a parent may be doing a fair amount of heavy lifting. Um, and, and what I've offered up is the Fermi paradox that I know. The, the only Fermi paradox that I know is the one on North Sentinel Island in the Andaman chain, because the islanders uh, are effectively Indians, but they don't know that they're Indians. They may not even know that India exists or that India claims North Sentinel Island mm -hmm. or that it won't let anyone land there. And my other claim is that I believe that a good chunk of humanity has um, stumbled into a very appealing wrong idea. So first I want to talk about the appeal of the wrong idea. The wrong idea is the more we find out, the more we realize how little we understand. There's something like really comforting about this, you know, and imagine that you, you apply this generally, like, you know, the longer I'm in love, the more I realize how little I understand about the human heart. Oh, that's beautiful. But then you, you apply it to real things. Like the longer I study continental exploration, the more I realize that every new landmass uh, we find on earth is just an indication of how many land masses we have yet to find that's like the dumbest thing you could possibly say but it has the same basic feeling well i think we're almost at the end i think we are afraid to say something which has always been false in the past now mm. the thing is we're almost at the end of the rules of physics when Somebody says that, everyone says, yeah, Lord Kelvin said that. They thought that that was true and they had the, the proton flaws. and the electron, and then they found the neutron. Okay, well, yes, and it was always true that powered human flight was never gonna happen because it had never happened until it happened. And it was the same thing, you know, there was this landmass off of Siberia that I think was discovered in the 20th century, which is the last major landmass to be found. Um, Nobody's worried about the idea that there are uncharted desert isles uh, on Earth because we have the satellite data. We're about at the end of physics, I think. Now, that could be wrong. The easy way is, easiest way for it to be wrong is that we would be at the end of this chapter, but it would be a book with many chapters, and you have to finish this chapter to know that there are chapters to follow, okay? What if, for the moment, uh, I take the contrarian position and say, no, 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 I think this is about to wrap up. And the really weird thing is, is that it's taken from 1945 until the present um, for us to get close. That's a, the blink of an eye in cosmic time. But my belief is, is that if anything is monitoring us, and if I'm not wrong, um, right before you have the full power of the laws of physics, you let off a nuke. And then you go from fission to fusion. And so the concern that I have is, first of all, that the Fermi paradox on North Sentinel Island is the same as the Fermi paradox we have here on Earth, where we are in the North Sentinelese, and we're trying to guess that India exists. So my question to you is, first of all, is there some sort of a thing that doesn't want us contacted, that is shielding us, the way India shields North Sentinel Island? And is it the case that whatever it is, is you know, while we think, oh, well, geez, you know, Sam Harris, my friend, said uh, whoever is out there must be, you know, millions of years and more advanced. They, they would view us as aphids. Nonsense. Um, there is probably a level of sophistication where it kind of taps out. And, you know, you can build bigger and bigger computers, but you're not going to discover more land masses on Earth, and I don't know that you're going to discover more laws of physics. I'm concerned, quite honestly, that we've lost our fear of the cosmos, just the way we've lost our fear of nukes, We've become relatively certain that nothing ever happens here, that we won't be visited, that there's no, there's nothing else other than us. And I'm worried that what we did is we alerted whatever is out there, hey, we're just about at the end and we're, we haven't worked out our stuff and we're going to be able 
to get off this rock if you are able to get off this rock. I mean, to, to come visit this rock, rather. So if things can visit us, we can leave. Now, it may be that all the planets are ru you know, rushing away from each other um, because of the expansion of the metric of uh, space-like splices and slices in the universe. But um, if the next theory has the power to get us really far really easily, and far might be in many dimensions, not all of them spatial, I would be very worried that whatever is watching us knows how close we are. So, I mean, we have to admit the mastodon in the room is that we have no evidence. <laughs> There's life elsewhere. I stole that from Sir Roger Penrose. Uh, that they're, you know, they're, they're and, and we hear this Lee Cronin and uh, my friend uh, near, uh, Sarah Walker, you know, they were just on Lex and, and they're, ta they're talking very, very specifically about the traits and characteristics of these aliens and what they're going to be like and how you can calculate exactly how much structure went into them and how you could detect them and their molecules. And it's all very interesting, and it's rooted in sound chemical and physical reasoning. Uh, but there's still this huge, you know, lacuna, which is that there's zero evidence. And in fact, I, I want to try and uh, uh, I want to try something out on you, an argument that I have, which will sound dirty, uh, but it's not, and you know it's not. Uh, and it's called panspermia, pan spermia okay now it sounds dirty but it involves the exchange of of material between planets in our solar system and other uh, solar systems perhaps and uh you talked to avi Loeb, our mutual friend mm -hmm. uh not too long ago in miami also while he was uh uh, uh, uh down there with you <clears throat> um and uh he talked about the uh almost you know definite admission by the u.s government that uh an extraterrestrial meteorite uh, had landed from another solar system in the somewhere in the ocean on Earth, and uh, and that was obtained. And I love Avi. I'm, you know, like you, you know, kind of helping him out on his project Galileo. Uh, so we're we're both, you know, kind of Avi uh, maximalists uh, to use mixed metaphors. But Avi, uh, you know, claims this is there, and it's based on trajectory data. Highly controversial. People, you know, can't reproduce it. But at any rate. It, if true, highlights the fact that materials such as this meteorite, and I've given you several of these, and you tried to snort one once. Um, anyway, these are meteorites. They come from Argentina. They're delivered the by gravity and the U.S. Postal Service. They're hard iron, uh, silicon, and co uh, cobalt. They're highly magnetic. And uh, they came, and they smashed into Earth. Now, there are meteorites that I will never give to you because they cost as much as my first you know, two cars put together, uh, I have, and it came from the planet Mars. So I have a chunk of Mars in my uh, in my lab, and that chunk of Mars uh, was proven by gas chromatography and other tools to originate from Mars. Okay, now, how did it get here? Same way, blasted off of Mars by a Martian meteorite, kicked around the solar system for a few million years, landed on Earth in Northwest Africa. Now, the same process happens in reverse. Life carrying molecules could be embedded on rocks and you know, a chunk of a whale gets kicked out into space and then eventually lands on Mars, right? But we have no evidence of that. We have no evidence of that happening over billions of years. Now, this, could, this, could, this has been happening as long as life has been on Earth, which Lee and others tell me is four billion years. So you have four billion years of opportunity to have panspermic transfers of a life that we know exists on Earth going to other parts of our solar system. And there's zero evidence, not, you know, I'm not asking for terraformed, you know, plateaus on Venus. I'm just saying there's no evidence. Now, absence of evidence isn't proof of, of absence, but um, shouldn't, at some point, people start to take the lack of, of you know, a, any sort of data or, or what, what have you as, as troubling in a Bayesian sense, that you can't put a prior that is so certain, close to 100%, Lee tells me, that he believes aliens are inevitable, and you sound like you believe it as well. So I want to ask you, what level, what would it take you to believe that aliens don't exist? Alien life, forget about intelligent, just life does anywhere not exist. Anywhere in the universe? Anywhere else in the universe. What would, I mean, what would I have to ask, what, what piece of evidence would you have to have to know that's impossible, that, you know, it's impossible to, for life to be elsewhere than Earth? Impossible? Oh, there's or, or vanishingly, sense. vanishingly small. In other words, the people that say it's guaranteed, like Avi and Lee, and maybe you, I don't know, uh, say it's it's all but guaranteed. The Fermi, you know, kind of suggestion is all but guaranteed. Uh, so, what series of pieces of evidence would decrease that 
to as close to zero as you could imagine. You can't rule it out, obviously. Oh, you're going to hate this answer. Uh, we would get to the next level in physics. We would find out that it does give us the ability to buzz the cosmos. We would send out an enormous number of probes, and we would change our we would tutor our Bayesian prior by exploring all of the most Earth-like exoplanets we could find, uh, which are now cheap to visit because of new discoveries that were not a, a, available to us when we were stuck with Einstein's effective theory or, or quantum field theory. That was what it would take. Um, right now, I can't see almost anything. Really? I mean, I can't get you beyond C, but I can get you to C. I can get you the speed of light, right? We can have a a uh, discussion about the simulation hypothesis and that we can have avatars cruising about the universe. We don't see any evidence of that either, as uh, in contrast to my guest David Chalmers' claim. Uh, you know, so, so, I mean, we could travel at the speed of light. Isn't that good enough? Do we really have to go beyond uh, the speed of light before you believe that they don't exist? You know, Brian, I, I don't know how to think about this. There's a suite of problems that is different than any problem we've ever solved in science. One of them would be the beginning. How did life begin? That would be an example of the class of problems I want to talk about. Or another one of these would be uh, how do you get consciousness to evolve from the material world? Um, another of these would be contact or the ability to prove uh, where did the origin of the universe what is the origin of the universe what is behind the surface of last scattering mm. um why do men and women take so much such different times when going to the restroom you know there, there are <laughs> various reasonable things. eric what there's some things man is not meant to know literally exactly that's what i was trying to say with the surface of last scattering um i i, I believe that uh we haven't solved any of these problems ever. The hardest things that we know how to do, uh, look, the hardest thing that I know is quantum field theory. And have quantum you tried field Wordle? theory- Have you tried Wordle? No, I have not tried Wordle. Um, quantum field theory is unbelievably difficult to learn. And it has gotten harder and easier. now. I have the entire standard model in stylized form that animates. Uh, you know, this is the classical input that when quantized gives us our understanding of the world. And it's incredibly simple. The, the idea that this fits on a mug is, and, and, and you and I can go line by line, symbol by symbol and say what everything is. Grand drinkification. <laughs> the, um, we have only solved problems in the shallow end of science. We have never solved a problem outside of the shallow end of science. And so when people start to talk about like free will, I just think, wow, you've gone from, uh, you know, wearing floaties in the shallow end with your parents holding you up uh, to wanting to surf shark infect infested waters, uh, you know, off the coast of Portugal with monster waves and, and you know, sharp rocks or who knows what. It's like, it's a totally different level of science to figure out life's origin or consciousness or the beginning of the universe. We haven't gotten to any of these yet. And I think what we're very good at is we're very good at extremely hard, simple problems. So we're all interested in these questions but my interest isn't in the recreational version of these. I know that if you and I did nothing else other than talk about free will for a year, we would get nowhere if we, we the conversation would be recreational. We'd have no nothing. Choice. We'd have no choice but to get nowhere. We would have no, I think we could have many different possible conversations. None of them will get anywhere. So I'm always curious as to why people say, I believe in free will, I don't. Okay, so you're gonna do that thing. Um, we need to do things that might work. And the things that might work have to do with like, you know, uh, my friend Rima Khan is about to have her SETI meeting uh, in San Francisco. You know, we can listen for things. We can try to work on the laws of physics. I cannot believe we are still focused on rockets. 
but very rich people seem to like rockets if they have any idea of the danger we're, we're in here on Earth. I think it's a completely bizarre feature of wealth and, and brilliance that brilliant, smart people choose rockets. Don't know why. Um, we got to do something. And we've never solved any of these problems. And I don't think we're going to get to these problems by pretending. I mean, I, I, I always want when somebody talks to me about what life will be like to bring up cephalopods. If I look at a cuttlefish and I look at how intelligent a cuttlefish is, maybe not as smart as an octopus, but a cuttlefish is such an alien creature. It's so far away from us on the phylogenetic tree that it proves that you can't really easily anticipate what smart looks like. And it's pro probably the reason that the heptapods were used in that movie. What is it? Arrival? Arrival. Yeah. Um, and I think that the next physical theory is going to blow our minds. I think we've sat so long pretending to have our minds blown by entanglement and Schrodinger's cat and, you know, the fact that you get thinner and heavier, you know, uh, in relativity theory, whatever. Ter terrible paradox. Not lying. Um, that uh, that's not really the mind-blowing stuff. What's about to come, I think, is going to rewrite our knowledge of ourselves just the way DNA did. So, so pitch me, uh, I'm Elon, you know, I can uh, take $44 billion and put it towards Twitter. I can uh, scrap it and uh, put, or even, you know, make it $43 billion. What, what, what do you tell him? What should he do? What would you do? He knows. He knows. I mean, what, what would I do? I mean, he's a physics major. He was at UPenn. Uh, I mean, more you know, than like a physics yours. major. He's evidenced, I think, continuing interest in physics. But he has hijacked the conversation of getting off the planet, um, which should be a conversation about many, 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 many different experiments rather than the moon and Mars. And getting off with physics to being a, a conversation about rockets. So anytime you talk about diversifying existential risk to humans, um, someone will now say, oh, don't worry, bro. Elon's going to get us to Mars with those awesome, awesome rockets. It's just like, I don't understand this. So I, I can't pitch Elon. So would I you don't go, know. I mean, but, but, but again, to push back with respect, as you know, I always do. And I cheerfully uh, recognize that I may have a huge blind spots myself. But mm -hmm. it's, it seems to me as if you're going back to 1491 and you're telling, you know, Queen Esmeralda or whoever, um, don't fund this guy, Chris, uh, Chris C. Uh, don't, don't fund whoa, him because he's just. Wait, wait, wait. That doesn't make sense. We should do rockets. Okay. We shouldn't obsess about rockets. Right, I mean, not rockets only in the portfolio. But but again, let me just finish my tortured analogy because it took me like half an hour to make it up in the shower this morning. Uh, but, uh, you know, are you telling her uh, we should really fund this guy, you know, Yitzhak Newton, uh, or, you know, to get these laws that will actually take us to the moon. Uh, you know, let, let's just uh, skip ahead. Boats, forget about these barks and and, uh, and, and boats. Let's galleons. Let, let's skip ahead. Um, I don't know that that would actually get us where we want to go, right? Because it, it, you're saying, you know, this your priors are going to be informed uh, by the either an, a no-go theorem that says we can't go beyond Einstein, in which case, what would you say? There are no aliens? If, if we couldn't go beyond Einstein... Yeah, if we're trapped there's in no, four, there's three no, plus one. So, like, this is another problem, which is, is that Einstein hijacked the conversation so that now every time we talk, it's like, no, dude, we, we have time dilation, we have wormholes, it's like, we have Alcubierre drives. Lost him with my laser. There, I'm blinding him. Oh, no, I He's thought you down. were making him a, a crypto enthusiast with laser eyes. That's right. Einstein with laser eyes. I, I told you. Um, okay. Don't you? Okay. So um, I don't think Elon shouldn't do rockets. I think rockets is a profitable business. And I think getting people excited about the future has to do with going back to the last moment when we actually, as a country, you know, we didn't want to say let's develop ICBMs that are really efficient in uh, hitting Beijing and Moscow. We said uh, we choose to go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> and um, OK, so, you know, true enough. So go to the moon. 
but stop with the terraforming and Mars is the, in the, the light of human civilization. I, I just, you have to actually want to save us from ourselves right now and talk about it in order to realize how completely crazy Elon has made everyone who listens to him. Because at the moment, if you had Einstein and you had Elon, people would be gravitating to Elon. Hmm. He's charismatic. Cultish He's male worship. in a world which is not comfortable with masculine traits. He's highly chaotic. He's very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And people have this idea of like, yo, dude, he's the richest man in the world, bro. And that's the currency of our time. So my feeling about this is everyone Elon reaches with the story of terraforming Mars with rockets and all this kind of stuff thinks that's the plan. And I just think it's, it's completely crazy to get everything right and then go rockets terraform in Mars right at the end. And it's just like, dude, I just read this entire, you know, war and peace length novel. And then in the last page, you just, you just do something completely bizarre. I just don't get it. Maybe I'm dumb. Maybe I don't, I don't understand. I don't think it's Ferdinand and Isabella. I think that they, you know, we needed to fund universities that studied natural philosophy and, and, and mathematics and physics. And we needed to explore the world because we didn't know what was here. And we should go to Mars and we should go to the moon. And we should have, I, if somebody said that our rocket allocation is stupid, we should take it to zero. I would be fighting tooth and nail to make sure that rockets are budgeted for. Okay. The mm -hmm. emphasis on rockets is psychotic. It's, it's like you're looking at a portfolio of a very, very rich person that's only in one municipal bond or something. And you're like, or SPAC. make, make this make sense. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, but then of course he is, you know, more diversified neurologically than almost anybody. <clears throat> uh, we can, I'm just saying that he doesn't have the right to hijack the rock, the, the, the we need to spread out and diversify because we're going to get ourselves killed on one planet with a shared atmosphere. It's completely unreasonable for him. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, I, I just, I have a very clear idea that he's one of the smartest, most forward thinking people and he's got a rocket company and he's talking in some sense, his book. Right. And no. he, he knows, look, I don't know him, but I almost, I almost feel like I can guarantee you he knows better. And so, you know, I don't want to speculate on what his strategy is, but he knows better than to bet everything on Mars terraforming and the moon with rockets. Right. Now, um, pivoting maybe slightly away, we look at, um, you know, what, what we could do. You pointed to one thing in there. You mentioned universities and how important they were. Now, in 1492, the university system was only about 400 years old at that point, and, and it's, it's aged since then and starting in 1080 or so in Bologna. Uh, and very little has changed. And I wonder, you know, the best and the brightest, so to speak, what they might be getting sucked up into this orbit of Elon, no pun intended, or, or this, this kind of thinking, or many other things, crypto. Uh, but at least people like Michael Saylor, who I had on the show uh, last year, <clears throat> uh, is very gracious and... and and forward thinking as well. Um, you know, he started Sailor Academy, and that's sort of a university that only is going to produce STEM majors, not going to produce, you know, um, gender studies majors, and it's not going to produce uh, things that are not related to pure science, technology, engineering, right. and math. Because he believes that we need, you know, a million PhDs in in these fields in order for us to progress. And actually, I think the I think the limiting factor for Elon is going to be uh, humans. It's not going to be robots. It's not going to be capital. It's going to be having enough people. And, and so the, the fault that I have for him is that he, I don't see any, and I'm not saying, oh, give, you know, uh, yesterday a billion, $100 million was given to Stanford University for sustainability. I'm not even saying, Elon, you know, hook UCSD up with, uh, with the Musk Institute and we'll churn out your PhD, because I don't think I can do it either. Uh, is that is there a fundamental limitation for us getting off the planet in your language uh, or becoming interplanetary in his language or transcending the laws of physics in your language, getting off the planetary species in his language? Mm -hmm. Is it humans and is it solvable? Because I can't just nucleate as good as I am. 
You can't just nuclear no. it out of the vacuum, kids. Well, but okay, so let's look at the very weird question of anybody with a halfway interesting version of a theory beyond the standard model. And I don't mean, sorry, I'm going to be very careful about the phrasing. We have large programs, grand unification, supersymmetry, technicolors, super strings, et cetera. Um, these are the big programs. More or less, if you're not on a big program, I know of almost no one inside the university system who's got a truly interesting, audacious idea for what to do next. I could tell you that you know, Peter Woit, for example, has moved from being a curmudgeon to actually saying this I believe, which is fascinating. I mean, imagine if Sabina Hassenfelder, uh, instead of complaining about the gobbledygook or the fact that people are, are actually, you know, and, and she's quite accurate, I think, about this, overselling things that don't work. But I really love that Peter moved towards saying this is what I think may be generating all of this. He's there in a non-traditional role inside of the math department of Columbia University. He's writing books, he's writing papers, he's giving talks, but he's not a professor. Same thing with, you know, David Deutsch has a really weird situation at Oxford. Garrett Lisi has a very weird situation wherever he is. Mm -hmm. Julian Barbour has a weird situation. Stephen Wolfram. Inside the universities, we've turned it into the Hunger Games academically, and so everyone is worried about survival, and nobody's actually worried about physics because they're worried about personal survival. They're not worried about general survival. I think what you have to look at is that there is a reluctance. I mean, one of the things I say that doesn't win me a ton of friends is that it appears that nobody actually has any money. And... Um, the reason that I say that is that all sorts of, it, it feels to me like nobody, uh, we have Rockefeller, there, there were Rockefellers, and they built Rockefeller University and the University of Chicago, one of our absolute jewels. Um, you know, Vanderbilt, there's a Vanderbilt University. Carnegie had money, there's a Carnegie. Leyland Stanford, we don't want to invest anymore in this stuff. Um, there's a general anti-science thing, partially, I think, fueled by the fact that when Anthony Fauci says, I am the science, trust the science, mm -hmm. we, 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 the science. we are revulsed. Um, we recoil in horror, maybe I should say it that way. And I think people who have money are turning away from universities um, because those containers are seemingly very susceptible to revolutionary nonsense. And so why would you build a container and then put great stuff in it only to have it instantly corrupted by the associate dean of niceness, goodness, and fluffy puppy dogs for uh, pediatric oncology patients? You know, it's like, okay, we need to help kids who are facing cancer. We need... I, I have a dog, I like good things, ice cream, blah, 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 blah. But the university is attesting to their own fundamental goodness at every turn and denouncing everyone who disagrees with them as Genghis Khan, Hitler, or uh, Lizzie Borden, or whatever. It's not a very appealing uh, pitch to people with resources. So what I'm seeing is that more or less people with incredible resources don't want to spend on things that are important. They've been tinged with this kind of failure and greediness and my, my you know, Brian, you're doing something. I'm focusing, um, focusing. Okay. <laughs> I, I think one of the things we need to do is if, if, if the government is just going to renege on the endless frontier compact between the universities and the federal government, I don't want to be in a intellectual property category where we can't monetize what we discover. 
I just want to take you by your ankles and say, God damn it, you fooled us. Give us all our, our money back that we generated for you. We built the entire economy and you treat us uh, like we're your servants. You're making me sick to my stomach. For God's sakes, grow a pair and recognize you've got the world's greatest deal and that these people basically have integrity and you're turning their lives upside down into a horror where people don't want to go in to their offices and universities. And, you know, when I was just touring universities on the East Coast, um, professors would close their doors and in hushed tones, they would say, you know, I can't really say this outside, but things have gotten really crazy here. And I'm thinking, you're the owners of the university. No matter what anyone tells you, you don't want to send your kid to a university that isn't run effectively by its professors. Universities are not primarily about teaching. You should go to a college if you're focused on teaching. Universities are about research. And the research is done by professors, and by far the most research, uh, the most important research is done in STEM. I mean, I think there's very important research that's been done in folklore. Ethnomusicology was something I considered going into. Um, there's plenty of things that can be researched that aren't STEM, but the most important things we do is to better understand the world in which we live, gain power and wisdom to control it. And if the humanities aren't going to be giving us wisdom, but are going to be giving us negative wisdom, it's very important that anybody with hate in their heart who talks about anti-racism all day long, which is just another name for racism, should not be informing people who might have to make nuclear weapons or fuel air explosives or any one of the horrible things uh, that we may need to keep ourselves safe. It's very important to keep lunatics away from the stuff that actually works. And I mean, I, 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 I've always agreed with you in, in general terms, <clears throat> um, but I do feel like uh, we have uh, kind of an opportunity that is only, you know, kind of full of latency when it's uh, thought prospectively in the future. In other words, the inventor of the laser, you know, uh, Charlie Towns, or the inventor uh, uh, of, you know, GPS and things like that, or Einstein, these, these people died, you know, not, not wealthy people. Uh, and, and yet, if they had attempted, and, and yet the, the uh, creator of Ethernet, you know, the 3Com, <laughs> you know, is currently a triple. Wealthy in what terms, Brian? Wealthy financially. So okay. you know, now we can define wealth other ways, obviously. But, but, but let's, let's, let's pause that just for one second. I'm going to disagree in very strong terms. I went into academics in large measure for freedom. And that's why people go into business for freedom. I think that if you priced the freedom that somebody like Noam Chomsky enjoyed, you know, probably had his pension taken care of, probably was made an institute professor at MIT, could draw off on any topic. He had this giant uh, army behind him that would stand up for his freedom of expression and freedom of inquiry. The functional equivalent of Noam Chomsky's wealth was absolutely enormous. Oh, sure. I'm not debating that. And you can have, right. by the way, you can have both. Elon, you know, dictates you can have both. You can have intellectual capital as well. But I'm thinking purely for the translation ability of wealth to then be used to research purposes. So you made the argument that we should have taxed, you know, uh, semiconductor instructions or emails, all of which are invented by physicists or applied. No, no, we shouldn't have done that. We should have kept our agreements. But if you're going to be a prick about it, right. by, by all means, you're basically taking everything that was developed by people that you now treat as your servants, um, who you've actually legally hobbled. And my feeling about this is that's completely unethical. I, 100%. All, all yeah. I'm saying is that uh, the biggest lie in finance is that past performance isn't indicative of future, you know, returns. I mean, look at uh, look at whatever, pick whatever pre.com guy, uh, you know, company you like. So all I'm saying is that given that academia academicians like the ones that you mentioned have been treated like garbage and that physicists have not been able to not monetize for our selfish own internal purposes, which I believe we, we deserve, but I'm not going to talk about that, for the purpose of physics, for the greater glory yeah. of physics, I claim we need to start with an educational campaign now. In other words, we need to say the next project that's going to be developed with quantum computing or before it's monetized and we lose the rights to say, hold on, I didn't sign off on this IP. 
we need to be smart. And I don't think there's any training. You know, certainly I'm guilty. I don't train my graduates since I'm blessed to have so many brilliant kids. I never sit down and say, if you ever get into a situation, I have two patents, by the way. I never sit down and say, like, hmm, if I'm ever in the situation where this thing could make, you know, millions of, like, here's what I should do in order to benefit. But I think we need something. It's, it should be in some way incorporated into our education. And I think the best way to do that, ironically, is through the humanities. Show through history of physics, as you know better than anybody. Although I always say, it's, if, you want to, if you want to damn somebody with faint praise as a scientist, you say, he's really knowledgeable about the, the history of physics. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's such, it's such a backhanded compliment. But you do, in all honesty and all seriousness, you do understand it. And well, you articulate let me it well. i push back on that because that's kind of a dig. Um, my feeling about this is is you don't need to know the history of physics if you want to do relatively workmanlike um, scientific research. The, the only people who really need to understand the history of physics aren't most physicists. It's the tiny number of people who are going to do things like break new ground. So it's really important not to sell the history of physics to everybody. You can become a calculational monkey uh, and go to any uh, calculational monkey school and do calculational monkey equations. That's fine. The really hard thing is to try to figure out how did people break out of cognitive prisons? And so, you know, some of the, <laughs> one of the funniest things is when people have these insults, like, uh, like the one you just said, it's like, well, yeah, because you didn't understand what it was about to begin with. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I guess all I'm saying is, wouldn't it be great to have education so that the next time we invent the internet, you know, uh, hypertext protocols, uh, that we can think for a second that how do we do this? Right. How do we renegotiate the contract? That's what I want to say. You, you're, you're very astute. You've picked up on the problem, but we can't go back and rectify the past performance, but we can say, given the way that the history of the field is gone, you, when yeah. you invent the, the, uh, the quantum, you know, beam, uh, you know, Bose Einstein condensate laser, uh, that will be used for God knows what, uh, w before you do that, we should have an honest conversation about it, or CRISPR or you know, whatever. Okay, we should well, be... wh where are the mega fortunes that are interested in this stuff? And my claim is, um, you know, we, we both talked to Jim Simons. Jim knows how important this stuff is, and he's put a fair amount of capital um, behind this. Uh, in my, you know, at, at some point I had a conversation with him about fixing education. And he said, I spent a fair amount of time on it. And the only thing that actually seemed to make sense is to take terrible teachers and make them slightly less terrible. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was a heartbreaking thing. Was, so I've seen people plow money into some of these things and get very little back. Yeah. Um, the, the things that work can't be said very easily right now because they're out of keeping with the ethos of our time. Um, you meet people, he's like, how do you know who's good? Um, cause you talk to them, you find out whether they have 12 ideas before they have a cup of coffee and three of them are good, you know, three good ideas. That's astounding. It's hard to have good ideas. Um, we basically know who's good and we don't get to dial their facial characteristics or look at their chromosomes or whatever, you know, good is good. Um, famously Ramanujan was, uh, you know, sent a letter to, to Hardy and he and Littlewood, Hardy and Littlewood read it in Cambridge and they said, well, um, either he's a humbug or a genius. And we guessed genius because humbugs are relatively rare. Beautiful line. Um, <laughs> We know who's good, we know who to, who to fund, and we know how to leave people alone. And nobody wants to do it. Everybody wants to say, oh, it's all in the ethos and the myth of the lone individual. And, you know, this is so elitist and all this kind of nonsense. Okay, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're just, you're wrong 12,000 ways from Sunday. And you're going to destroy everything that we know how to do. Many of the people who make real breakthroughs um, are very difficult to deal with. And if you don't want to deal with people who are difficult to deal with, you can just sort of write off most progress. Right. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't leave Feynman alone with my daughter or your daughter, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but he sure knew his way. Uh, That's around. true because we don't want Feynman maced or, or kicked in the groin because he's a valuable human being. <laughs>
<laughs> and our kids are skilled in the deadly arts of the groin attack from Krav Maga training that we give them. And that is a mitzvah for all Vidyuk, those. Vidyuk, Vidyuk. Yes, exactly. Uh, so we're talking with Eric Weinstein, proprietor of the Portal Podcast, among other things. You can find Eric at Eric R. Weinstein at both Twitter and on Instagram. He has a website. Uh, it was about a year ago we had a conversation about geometric unity, and I want to talk about that uh, because sure. it's still it's still it haunts my dreams. It's still something that's very delightful, and uh, and it, it represents uh, a sort of a sort of you know candle in the darkness, a sort of hope, a scream in the void, uh, thinking big things. Uh, obviously, it's not uh, you know there there are people that have as you mentioned Peter Boyd, Garrett Lisi. Uh, there, there are a surfite of, of other uh, contender theories that have their own lacunae. But uh, where, where, where are you now with, with Geometric Unity? Where is the project at this point? Well, I'm talking to a lot more different physicists. Um, and Who have you I've met with most recently that's most exciting for you? Besides present company, obviously. Well, I mean, I don't want to get into details, but I think probably one of the best conversations I had recently uh, might have been with Nima. Uh, Arkani Hamed. Um, there's a local uh, graduate student. Where I'm going to mention his name because he deserves it. And what is a name to watch? Uh, Trevor Schopener uh, at UCLA is an unbelievable uh, up and coming guy in, uh, I think, V Burns group. Um, but I've been, you know, talking with Avi about astrophysics, discussed with with Alan Guth recently, um, some aspects of uh, how multiple generations are generated, um, just a fairly colleagues in France. Um, I've been I've been very lucky to have access to great people, and I think that one of the things that's happened is that with supersymmetry. And with string theory not being able to um, find something that, that really shows us that they're on the right track, um, people are slowly open to the idea of either shutting high energy fundamental physics down, and then I, it's gonna, people are going to be up in arms about that, but there's like a huge move to move towards quantum computation. And you say, why is that? And it's like, oh, well, because computers have been really important. And so the metaphor of a, the universe as a computer is really important. Um, information power, maybe we can rebase everything around information. It, it's, in a, it's something you can do, you can try. Um, but I think right at the moment, where we are is that um, We realize that the baby boomer program has run its course. And the baby boomer program was strings. Almost all of the people in string theory um, came up. Uh, they viewed the world a particular way. They changed the problems that we thought of as fundamental. Uh, quantizing gravity uh, became the the problem to work on, which I think was absolutely wrong. Um, and what, what we find ourselves in is a world in which the old thing that was crowding out everything else is in the process of dying, and that is string fundamentalism. And one of the great things about talking to Nima was, for me, that Nima is not captured by strings, but he's animated by strings which is the, exactly the right position to be in, which is that you're not 100% sure that strings are the right direction to go, but you can say, look at all of the things that string theory accomplishes inside of quantum field theory. It gives us paradigmatic um, ways in which we can elude certain seemingly no-go theorems and the like, or it's taught us a lot. And I think that the toy theories that really came along with the string guys, because the string guys, they are mostly guys, um, not 100%, but uh, too much, um, more or less uh, used a lot of toy quantum field theories to explore some of these ideas. That was a sort of a second program. 
That was very good, by the way, um, on their part for developing quantum field theory as a discipline, mm -hmm. but it's been a disaster for uncovering new physical law and new physical explanations. So I do think that right at the moment, um, people would be open, but there's no, uh, we should be building accelerators. We should be getting people, here's the crazy thing, Brian. I, I'm dancing around it and trying not to say it, but maybe I'll just say it. We just had this W mass announcement. The W particle appears to be much heavier. And by much, I don't mean like three times as heavy, but I mean by an appreciable amount heavier than we had thought. And I watch everyone's explanations of this to the public. And I haven't seen one that really sounds to me like what this thing actually is. We, we settle on these, here's how we talk to the public about the W mass issue. Well, what is the W particle? It's more or less a part of a derivative from calculus. And what does a derivative want to do? It wants to differentiate functions. Well, what functions does it have? Well, it can differentiate something called a Higgs field. Now, if you look at this mug, for example, and I'm not good at going around. Drinking and I've, deriving. Drinking and go. deriving. That term right there, which probably looks like d sub mu of phi norm squared, that term is where the W particle interacts with the Higgs particle. So you're effectively using the W particle to differentiate a Higgs particle just the way you use the photon to differentiate a, an electron. That process by which the Higgs particle gives mass to a small number of pieces of a derivative, the W and Z particles, it gives mass in some sense to itself. Um, you've got this potential term here. You've got Yukawa terms here where it's giving mass, the same phi is occurring here. Uh, all of, I'm sorry, not hold that up. So this is where the W particle is getting mass. This is where the Higgs is getting mass from itself through its interaction with the Mexican hat potential, the sombrero. The, the the Yukawa the, yeah, the, the Yukawa term where the, the fermions, the electrons and protons get mass. That whole system isn't explained to anybody in the public, which is criminal. And, it, you know, and then I, I've sort of been in this kind of self-examination phase, which is people say, oh, Eric, you use so many big words. Why can't you understand? Why, why can't we understand you? It's like, well, one thing is almost nobody's actually trying to tell you what's really going on. And when I sit there and I say, okay, the W particle is part of a derivative, all my colleagues know what I'm saying, but they're not venturing out there to say something so simple. And I don't know why they're not doing it. So the public isn't animated. Like, the fact is, this mug, if you had this mug in your house and you said, somebody, somebody told you, more or less everything other than gravity is on that mug, somebody would want to know, one person in your family, like, well, how do I read it? What does it mean? What are the different terms? Do they have names? Nobody is talking to the public about what it is that we do. And that's how I get into trouble. I say, you know, hey, I have an explanation for why there are three generations of matter. You're like, I don't even know that's a problem. <laughs> okay. So if you think about the sort of things that GU is doing different than, let's say, Garrett or, or Peter Woit, one of the things I think that's exciting is, is that a good theory should probably tell the standard model in general relativity what it got wrong. And I don't think anybody inside of the academic system wants to do that. They want to extend only. You know, and this is why, for example, everybody will add sterile neutrinos to the standard model because it's like it's the least offensive thing that won't screw anything up. So I've been thinking a lot about this, which is why do why do none of us talk to the public in real terms? Why do we allow Feynman's dumbest statements to characterize uh, what seems to be the height of sophistication. If you, can't, if you can't explain it to your grandma, it means you don't understand it. If I can't create the word, world myself, then, uh, then I'm useless. And it's like, okay, well, it, it's, it's a lot of machismo, but it's not very smart. And in those, 
in those opportunities, none of us are really filling it in. We're not talking about what the W particle is. We're not talking about why it's important. We're not talking about why this is so exciting I can hardly sleep. I don't, know. I don't even know that it's real. Maybe fight, it may, may be wrong. Well, but we know the, things are real. We know calculus is real. And let's start with a, you know, when I learned calculus, I had to self-teach it to myself because I actually wasn't placed it along a math track that would have taken me to take the APs. And I had to kind of self-motivate. And that came because of a love of astronomy that I wanted to find out, well, how do we know these galaxies are moving away? How do we know Halley's Comet's orbit and all sorts of things that were going on at the time when I was, uh, you know, preteen. <clears throat> and so I had to teach it myself. But once I learned it, I kind of felt like I had you know, gotten the cheat code, you know, and just, I started to see things in a different way. And I went through the portal. And at that moment, uh, I felt a great gift had been given to me. And it was given by myself, but in the sense that I was given these gifts from the great people that came before me, including my hero, uh, Galilei, uh, Ga Galileo Galilei, who I want to talk about because I have exciting news about a wonderful project that I've been uh, blessed to work on the last couple of uh, years now, and it's come to fruition. Um, but, uh, but I feel like we're doing a disservice. That's why I say I kind of joke in the past, but I'm getting more and more serious. I feel the scientists like me, especially like me, who get paid by the public, um, have a moral obligation to uh, teach the most exciting and most uh, d delightful, delicious developments to the public for free, and they should do that as part of their as part of their job, quote unquote. And they'll say, "I'm not good at it," and to which I'll say, "Oh yeah, I forgot. When you were born, you knew quantum field theory. Oh no, no, I had to learn that. It was very hard, and it's very sophisticated." Okay, so you spend time on things you think are valuable, right, my fellow professors? And it doesn't make me popular around the faculty club. But I do believe that, you know, especially, but and every professor, every scientist is supported by the public at some level or another. So, you know, we have a we have a huge you know, we have a branding problem. We talked about the marketing problem, but we also have kind of a um, an education and a and a and a, and a self obligation that scientists don't feel. We feel like we can sit around and be the be the equation monkeys that you were talking about before. Well, that's not true, Brian. I, I just I mean I disagree with this. Here's the basic problem because I've gone through this now. Let's imagine you want to understand what the W particle is and the Higgs particle and why this matters, right? So there's some safe thing that everyone can say, and then you can try to actually be real and then get attacked. So I don't like being attacked. It's, it, I've got idiots who follow me around, who call up my colleagues and try to alienate everyone from me. And my feeling about these people is once you understand what the cost is. You understand why nobody does it. But here, here's a chord, okay? This chord represents a function. The height of the chord is a function. And the W particle is, in part, a level. And that level could be horizontal, mm -hmm. or we could use the level to define what is horizontal. Right? And so if I pick this, we all know that the derivative is the rise over run above that level. But if I say, you know what, I have fiat power, and I'm going to decide that not this, but this is level, then the chord that is tangent at that point is actually constant, even though it appears to be rising. Okay? Now, I didn't use any big words. You'll watch in the comments, Eric's showing off, Eric is doing... It's no, a, no. In the comments, not, people are saying, Eric, please write a book about this. No, well, some, most of them. But my point is, a tiny number of people who are terrible and who just don't want good things to happen don't want us to try and fumble in front of the public. And they don't want us to succeed because then we get large follower counts. And it's like, well, why is that guy the most you know, followed mathematician on Twitter? It's like, that should be me. Okay, maybe it should be you. Uh, I'll tell you the one thing. If you really have enemies, wish them fame. I promise you. They want it. You don't want it. It's, it's a great deal. Um, what we need to do is to be more courageous about saying, look, you're not going to understand quantum field theory, but here's some things you can break out. If you can keep up with the Kardashian, you can, you can keep up with quarks, or you can keep up with hadrons and leptons. There aren't, so many, there aren't so many hadrons and leptons that you can't learn them all in an afternoon, right? There are probably about as many fundamental particles as there are Kardashians. And 
the idea that we don't talk about this, we don't traffic in, we're not excited about this. Think about 90 years ago. We, it was, this is the 90th year anniversary of, of the neutron. We didn't know that there were neutrons. So my aunt, who is in her late 90s, grew up before there were neutrons. So when she was a very little girl, nobody knew what a neutron was. Almost immediately after the discovery of neutrons, we get chain reactions and we get atomic weapons and atomic power. That discovery within living memory made the world a completely different place and watch out for what comes next. As the, an adaptation of the old saying, you may not be interested in physics, but boy, is physics going to be interested in you. <laughs> and it, the idea that you're not part of the conversation, which is who are we, what is this place, and can we go and look at the night sky and dream responsibly, without wormholes and without sci-fi, of visiting. If that doesn't animate you, I guarantee you, you probably can't find a Jimi Hendrix guitar solo that moves you either. And that brings up the other chords that you're capable of bringing out. Show your guitar. We're going to get that at the very end. Um, so people in the chat room are saying things that Kim Kardashian actually has a nice set of bosons. That's kind of cool to know. Um, but Eric, uh, if, if actually listeners and viewers, the 700, 800 people watching right now, if you'd like Eric to write a book about this, give a thumbs up to this video and we'll see if we can create the groundswell necessary to do this labor of love, which is writing a book. And I've actually just produced my third book, uh, and I can't believe it, three books in four years. Uh, this one I didn't write. <clears throat> so this one I had a ghostwriter, literally, and the name of the ghostwriter. Wait a second. Are we on the verge of a major announcement, which I don't even know? You don't know it. Uh, it is it is a major announcement, at least in my life. I've been putting it out on Twitter here and there, <clears throat> but now I want to come clean and really announce it for, for, for uh, all time. And Love that it. is um, 390 years ago, a, uh, so 300 years before the neutron, uh, a man by the name of Galileo Galilei wrote a book that got him in a tiny bit of hot water. He was kind of the Weinstein of his day, uh, not, not afraid to be provocative in some ways, take liberties and take license. And he wrote a book called The Dialogue. And this book, it was in Italian, it was called The Dialogo. And it was in contradistinction to his first book called The Sidereus Nuncius. Sidereus Nuncius, as you all know, is Latin for starry messenger. And he was allowed to keep publishing in Latin because nobody spoke Latin. And so it wasn't a threat to the Catholic Church. Uh, but after he used the spyglass, as he called it, the perspective tube, the telescope, uh, he found that he could not really get over the overwhelming evidence that was presented to him, and he wanted to share it for the world with the notion that the universe is not centered on the Earth, it's centered on the sun. And so he was advancing Copernicus theory and uh, other earlier theories as well. And he wrote this wonderful book. It's called The Dialogue. It's actually a trialogue between three characters, uh, one of whom is modeled after Galileo himself. And he gave this character the name Salviati, the, sa sa the salvation. And then the other one was modeled after the Pope, Pope Urban, uh, and his arguments. And he put his arguments in the name of a character named Simplicio, the simpleton. Not the great, you know. I, I love this because it shows that, you know, even the most biggest geniuses in, in, in academia uh, can have huge uh, fatal flaws in their impolitic behavior. And then there's a third character who's an intelligent layperson. His name is Sagredo. So I got uh, the most famous uh, two Italians that I know, uh, Carlo Rovelli and uh, Fabiola Giannati, uh, who you love for her use of Comic Sans. Uh, and so uh, we, at the Higgs boson announcement, so we- You should say that one of them is a famous theorist that's attached to loop quantum gravity. The other one is a um, big shot uh, physicist uh, with uh, the CERN experiment. Yeah, she's the director of CERN. Uh, which is where the LHC is located and uh, responsible for discovery of the Higgs boson. So um, we, and along with Jim Gates, who's another friend of yours, a professor at the Ford Foundation, professor at Brown University, where I will be returning, and that's, stay tuned for a top secret announcement at the end of this month. Uh, I should say he's an acquaintance. I, I have great respect for him and I've enjoyed meeting him, but we are not close. So the five or six of us uh, put together a audiobook the first ever audiobook by Galileo. 
So it exists, and you can get it wherever books are audibleized, uh, including Amazon, Audible, uh, Google Play, wherever you like. I'll put a link to it in the uh, show notes below. And it was really a labor of love. It took us a year to record it, edit it. Uh, in our home studios around the world. In Italy, Carlo was in Italy, and in uh, Aix and Provence, or however you pronounce that. And then my friend Lucio Picciarillo is the third character. And we recorded it, and so much of what comes through in this wonderful book is is just beyond you know, my comprehension as a physicist. And actually, what, uh, oh, Frank Wilczek, I should say, narrated uh, the word and the Nobel Prize winner, 2004 Nobel Prize winner for Asymptotic Freedom, uh, he narrated the dedication by Albert Einstein, the foreword, to the book by Galileo, in which he calls this book by Galileo the most important book ever written. <laughs> and, Einstein called Galileo's book. Yes, Einstein called the dialogue the most, not not just science book, but really the most important book uh, that had really ever been written, fiction, nonfiction, however you like to say it, including his own work. So it was incredibly uh, gratifying to to have these people come together and do it. Uh, and of course, this book is Italian, and it was written originally in Italian, and we had to have it trans. It was translated, um, and so anyway, I, I started off doing it um, really kind of a, as as a kind of a lark. But then I uh, I decided that there could be some spinoff opportunities, not really just for me, but I think maybe for physics. And I want to get your your impression on. It. So one thing about this book, they're extremely expensive to get your hands on a, a original copy of the dialect. Three hundred ninety year old books are are very rare, obviously. Um, so I decided I have an, a collector friend who allowed me to scan pictures from it, and we're making NFTs of it. <laughs> and at first, I thought it was kind of silly, kind of crazy. Why would you make an NFT of a physical product or, or whatever? Um, but the more I thought about it, like, what if we could do use blockchain technology and science, not just for preserving, or maybe maybe we could make a DAO, one of these organizations, these entities, to buy these books before they get lost or, or stolen or, or whatever, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to get an original one. Um, but what if we could, you know, either custodize it or if we could use it to generate resources for physics? So I want to run that idea by you, not not specifically with my Galileo project, uh, but uh, but you know, that's just kind of my my testing the water with NFTs. Uh, but you can find that on my website, BrianKeating.com. Uh, uh, but you know, for a fraction of an ether. But what do you think about NFTs in science? What do you think about the prospects for using this blockchain technology? By any means necessary is where I am at the moment. Uh, I, Malcolm the Tenth, I think, was correct um, that we needed to. There's certain things that are just so important that I don't. I almost don't care how they happen. My my hope is that NFTs don't backfire on us, um, because the right thing to do is to make very serious people, very rich in autonomy so that they never think about, you know, look, making somebody a, a low eight digit millionaire, double digit millionaire, um, is probably sufficient to give them an extremely nice life. And there are tons of those who do far less for us than the people who uh, do our molecular biology, chemistry, mathematics, and physics. So mm -hmm. I do think that it's important um, if we're going to abandon all of our culture, we're going to leak everything, we're going to turn the universities into cesspools, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to get a few money to, to the people who built everything for us, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, those... What I don't want to see is I don't want to see it backfiring. I don't want to see a claim. Oh, well, you guys have your NFT, so you're good now. It's like, <laughs> no. Um, we're, we're scrambling um, because you screwed us over and you're idiots, and it's time for you to be ethical and smart. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very hard conversation to have. Uh, if we have to dramatize it by NFTs, so be it. Um, but my feeling is, what if the NFT thing goes in different directions? If it goes through to the moon, um, then it's a great move. What if it goes in the toilet? And now we've, we've sort of staked our credibility on getting involved in something that has a Ponzi scheme uh, built into it. I'm not saying it is a Ponzi scheme. No, I got it. But there, there is Ponzi in NFT, just as there is genius in NFT. I also want to point out that the concept of digital scarcity, if you go back to the original blockchain white paper of Satoshi, 
it's very, very clear that it's propagating uh, something according to a conservation law, that you uh, hand me your public key and I've got my private key and I've got this token that I'm laying claim to, I can propagate my token to you uh, in this infinite chain of custody um, by virtue of the fact that something is conserved. Now, of course, you had to, to create new tokens out of, out of the vacuum. But my, my belief is, is that one of the things is we should be talking about this in terms of digital conservation laws and digital physics. And we should be active. And I also think that, um, you know, having been playing with the, the crypto community a little bit, at first, they, they dismiss everybody because they think you come in from outside and you, you don't care about anything. You just want to tell people things. But um, we do know that uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of homology between Bitcoin and gauge theory. Um, conservation principles. Conservation principles have to do with symmetry. I am sure that if you and I got roaring drunk for two weeks uh, with a whiteboard, we would come up with a symmetry principle uh, for Bitcoin using some version of a discretized Nerder's theorem that took the conservation law that allows us to propagate, you know, Satoshi's solution of the double spend problem is probably worthy of some amazing science prize. It's, you know, just an ingenious idea. Um, and it's, it's hard to understand, like, what is the substrate of, of is, is it the idea that the individual wallets uh, the public private key pairs is it uh is it computers and nodes because you know the interesting thing is is that it was engineered so that nodes could go dark and you know that's like taking a chunk of space time out of commission um i, I think it's i think it's really important that physics get involved with nfts with conservation laws with digital physics and actually contribute into the system to make it much more useful. And while some in the crypto community will say, oh, they're just talking their book and to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, to a man with a gauge theory, everything looks like a conservation law. Um, just ignore those people. Uh, there are so many good people in crypto who are interested in any interesting idea. We need to party with them. more. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you to look into your crystal ball and maybe we'll do the, the lightning round as we like to do, Eric. Um, All right. Are we, done with, ready. are we done with COVID? No. Explain. Um, my feeling about this is that probably COVID is much worse than we thought or that we understand and that people who understood it were protecting us against something. This is, I don't know this to be true, but if I had to make a guess. The reason that China is so ferocious about trying to stamp COVID out is that I worry that they know something, that it's not a flu, that it's a cumulative flu that destroys you uh, bout by bout. Hmm. I don't know what this thing is. And I think it's, it's criminal that we're so far into this and we have no idea why China's behaving the way it's behaving or why Fauci behaves the way he behaves or Peter Daszak or Ralph Barrick or any of these people. Um, somehow this COVID is taking place out, outside of science. And it's, I, I'm worried that we don't understand what COVID is and we don't know which wave is going gonna, is gonna to hurt and how bad. I mean, no, I don't think so. I think that we decided that we're done with it because Omicron was relatively mild. But what COVID becomes next, I worry that certain people have much better understanding than, than you and I do, and that they know why this is so dangerous. I'm worried that they, the government lied twice for different reasons. The first time, I worry that they lied to protect what they were doing with DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Why was it working with EcoHealth Alliance, Wuhan Lab? Why under kindly Dr. Fauci, who seems to have something to do with a weapons portfolio, uh, getting around a couple of treaties that we signed and ratified in the 70s. I have no idea, but I think that that was a self-protective lying. And then I think that there may have been public spirited lying saying, we, if we could have told you what it is that we created in this uh, cauldron, um, we happen to have some inside information about this furin cleavage site and, and the potential to attack T cells and, 
and the degradation and why this uh, binds to so many different organs and can cross the blood brain barrier. I'm worried that they know that this is a much worse disease than it appears and that we're going to find out over time why they were so draconian because it does look like that they wildly overreacted not to say that people didn't die not to say that this wasn't serious but to shut down the world economy to the extent that they did clearly risked war at some level it wasn't that it was free and so i'm very worried that we don't really understand what COVID is and that omicron seemed kind of relatively mild but just wait something it's going to be wave after wave, and we're going to learn over time what this thing that really is. Do you see the um, midterm elections coming off without a hitch? Do you think it'll be a nice, smooth, orderly, I don't want to say transition to power. I don't want to assume what, what direction the elections are going to go. Do you think it's going to be a nice, smooth election in November? Uh, you're asking one of the middle children um, what to do about crazy mommy and crazy daddy, and my feeling is, is that... Uh, you know, dad should go off uh, in, in, uh, into his, his uh, meth den and, and mom should, should move out of the house with her various lovers. And uh, the same people who are left uh, should try to get back to the United States of America. I don't know how to do this. I, I, I view the Republican and Democratic parties as being dead enders. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's the it's the Thelma and Louise problem. Do, do you decide that uh, Thelma is better than Louise if, if uh, Louise takes longer to hit the ground? Uh, you know, by by a nanosecond. I, I don't know. I, I, I view. I'm so. You know what I've become? I've become attentionist. It's like you've got Bloods and Crips running your neighborhood, and you don't want to go blood or crip. You just want them to fight each other enough so that the rest of you can go to work, go to school, and. Uh, buy some groceries without being terrorized um <clears throat> more upbeat note are, are we headed for an u.s involvement on the ground in, <laughs> in the ukraine next question are you excited about any recent discoveries in physics we talked about the w boson mass discrepancy by the way it's not that the mass itself is so much higher it's that the precision is so with tension with the standard model that not that you said that but there are people in the chat room wondering is it eight times too high five sigma yeah no it's, no, it's, it's higher it's, but it's, the, the, the bounds on this thing are radically radically tightened and up this isn't new data this is old data new analysis um and they're you know it, it should be taken with some degree of of caution but but to that end people have been speculating about the role of fifth forces and all sorts of things ranging from uh, G minus two discrepancy, the magnetic moment um, of the muon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of tensions. I always say physicists need a psychologist. I think we've got so much tension on our uh -huh. minds. But where, where do you think, uh, what's exciting you? If you were a young physicist or if you knew a young physicist uh, who's starting out, what would you advise her to do? What excites you most in physics? Well, I, I, a theorist. I mean, we should talk about an experimentalist and a theorist, and I think we should talk about the experimentalist first, because I think one of the things that you've done is to emphasize that constantly uh, focusing on the lead singer, you know, it's like we're always talking about Mick Jagger and Keith Richards is holding it down, making the thing uh, awesome. Let's talk evenly about them. So what should a young experimentalist do? My feeling about that is you should figure out where there might be money and where there might be new tools and I would be thinking a lot about high precision experiments. I would be thinking a lot about gravitational waves um, because that's still relatively new. I would be thinking a great deal about which of these uh, hints in, uh, beyond the standard model physics um, might be most promising and how would I go about uh, the G minus two anomaly or the, the W anomaly or any of the other anomalies um, what are the what are the tools and and then you know the interstitial thing as you were saying uh, in some sense new analysis of old data is new data in a certain of a of a kind right yeah. because we have to process the original raw data um, and so it's never it's never pristinely coming from the universe it's itself directly what am I super excited about I'm super excited about getting back to the big questions 
we, we, we traded all of our big questions for can you quantize gravity, which assumes that gravity wants to be quantized the way everything else wanted to be quantized. I, 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 I'm tired of talking about um, white supremacy, but quantum supremacy, we can call it uh, quantum maximalism. Everything, it's sort of like dealing with Bitcoin maximalists. The people in the late, with the laser eyes are telling you quantize gravity rather than make the quantum more geometric because gravity has always been geometric since Einstein. What I'm super excited about in mass is looking at the different ways that mass can be generated inside of the models. So let's come up with three separate ways that you can generate mass. One way is, is that you could have more things to differentiate. If a piece of a derivative gains mass by differentiating something like a Higgs field, Maybe there are multiple Higgs fields and that more mass somehow comes out of a richer Higgs sector. That's sort of the, that's one of the things that might be interesting. There's a very funny result from dimension three that's peculiar to dimension three called topological mass that was pioneered by Roman Jakiv and others. Um, and that says that if you have a Yang-Mills term, so forgive me, if you have a term that looks like this at the top of the cup with the double Fs, um, and then you add another term that looks a little bit more like a matter equation, and it's only got one derivative rather than two, uh, sort of like the Dirac equation, it's called the Chern-Simons term. Um, in dimension three, that gives you a new way to generate mass that's not available elsewhere. Then, there's another way of generating mass, which is seemingly verboten, which is to put in a direct mass term for something like the W particle. So rather than a soft mass term, which gains the appearance of mass through an interaction, um, oh, I'll stop using this mug. Uh, I believe that in GU, there are ways to generate mass directly rather than indirectly that don't violate gauge conservation. So there are sort of three mass mechanism uh, channels that I'm looking at in GU relative to the discovery of the W particle. And this is something that I was excited about before, but I don't know. I mean, what are you supposed to say? If everything is working fine, it was an embarrassment that there were these extra terms. It's it's there in the draft. You can see where the mass is generated, um, but I don't I don't think I actually put in the uh, the Yang Millsian part uh, right. to the draft because of having something to do with the Higgs sector, which I'm very excited about. the The prospect for generating mass in novel ways, I think, uh, I expect to be one of the most exciting things to be coming up. Well, <clears throat> on that note, my friend, I want to wish everybody celebrating out there. Wait, wait, there was a guitar question. Oh, yeah, a guitar question. So What's you the made, guitar question? The guitar question is, uh, is the guitar hero dead? It's an interesting puzzle. Um, we just had this dinner where I was invited by a guy named Pliny. Yeah, talk um, about this picture. This guy tattooed everywhere except for maybe the whites of his eyes. You're talking about Tim Henson. Oh, yeah. Tim Henson is, I don't even know how to describe what kind of a wild guitarist he is, but look up Polyphia Goat for the most famous thing that he did. And I give the example, it's sort of like Havana Unana, okay. you know, um, but imagine that you had, or, or um, like smooth, it's got this kind of a Latin rhythm and feel and flow but imagine that somebody was juggling a fabergé egg a running chainsaw and a nuclear weapon and like it was just incredibly difficult to imagine the different things that they had to do when they were catching each one of these things tim is mixing up all sorts of ingenious i just love this guy um ingenious ways of taking and deconstructing and reconstructing and i want to emphasize reconstructing things that our brains and ears are want to hear and are used to hearing but need to be made fresh anew so i think that tim is one of the most exciting guitarists out there but i want to just i want to flog a bunch of names very quickly people who are exciting me 
Uh, Pliny's exciting me. Rick Beato is doing amazing things on his channel. Um, we are being treated to Mike Dawes and Tommy Emanuel uh, touring the country. Mike Isinger of Incubus. Um, John Mayer is one of the most unbelievable pedagogues out there. So he's not only playing his heart out with the blues, with you know, the level of people like Joe Bonamassa and uh, you know uh, uh, other people in that idiom, uh, a guy named King uh, Kingfish and uh, Eric Gales and Josh Smith. I'm just naming a bunch of people who, if you're not, if you want to get excited again about guitar, listen to these people. Um, as well as get excited about the gear. Uh, what's going on in gear? Um, the folks at Positive Grid just sent me a tiny amp that is effectively you charge. You know, it's, a, it's a, a little cube this big, and I've got the world's greatest amplifier simulated inside of this tiny little thing. Um, what's going on at Neural DSP? Uh, in their ability to simulate and capture instruments, and then you can you can capture like your own amplifier and digitize it. Um, so Doug Castro is doing amazing things. The people at High Vibe Acoustic Guitar uh, are blowing my mind by putting reverb, echo inside a, a classical instrument, effectively, or a wood instrument. Uh, this is out of France. Um, and what they're doing is turning our, they're blurring the line between an electric and acoustic guitar. So you can have distortion on an acoustic guitar because it takes the signal in and then it transforms it. And then it uses the vibrating wood, which is where we hear most of the sound. It's not from the strings, it's from the right. wood. Um, that stuff is being vibrated by these little, uh, I forget, actuators or whatever they call them. I think guitar is incredibly exciting right now. And I think that it, what, we, what we're missing is we're missing spontaneity and the blues and whatever it is that caused every show to be wildly different. We have too many people practicing very, very carefully. Um, and I'll just shout out Tosin Abasi and Misha Mansour, and I'm going to have more to say about this soon. Got it. <clears throat> well, uh, Eric? Can't thank you enough. People are asking you to break out a guitar, but I didn't ask you to pr plan that out. So unless you happen to have a little uh, Strat nearby, we'll have to do that next time. And people are asking us to go deep into the mug. So I think what we should do <laughs> next time is explore the mug in some detail. So on this channel. I would love to do that, but I would like to get some video aids and the two of us get excited about letting people know, here's the recipe for the universe so that maybe not everybody becomes a quantum field theorist instantly, but this is the greatest show on earth. There's nothing more interesting than this. And you shouldn't get frozen out of it just because uh, you didn't, math didn't agree with you in high school. So that's mm -hmm. what I have to say. That's right. So we tied in guitar strings and string theory um, so Eric, we do have facilities for that. We have an enormous green screen glass whiteboard uh, down here at UC San Diego, where you're always welcome. You know where your office is, and uh, Japanese we do, whiskey. We have Japanese whiskey. We have Cuban cigars. There. We have giant mushrooms, and we have uh, assorted accoutrements to go along with that. Uh, I want to notify people next week. There's going to be a big press release coming from the Event Horizon Telescope headed by uh, my friend Shep Dolman at Harvard Center for Astrophysics, and they're making an announcement involving a black hole in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a feeling it has to do with the ginormous 6 million solar mass at Wait. the center of a black hole. The black hole. The black hole, unless they've discovered another black hole, and that would be almost equal. Wait, you don't know what this announcement is? Are you teasing us? Do you actually know? This is know? a announcement of a press conference coming on Thursday next week, the 12th of May. I have a video queued up. I've done an you interview. Know? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I have my very strong suspicions. And so I will have a video out that day uh, about the uh, results on this channel. So I hope people will subscribe. Uh, I do a lot of uh, introductory kind of physics videos, but I do a lot of advanced physics. And I take the experimentalist tack, as Eric said. 
I love to go deep dive. I love my theorist friends. And my best friends are theorists, including Eric and Stefan. Would you and want your daughter to marry one? That's I would. I would. I would allow one of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, but in the same token, in favor uh, of mixed marriages. Exp- <laughs> that's right. Uh, experimentalists need some love too. Uh, the unsung exterminators of all theories in the universe. So for now, and I wish you all <laughs> a, uh, a a fruitful Cinco de Mayo. We're gonna go out drinking uh, next time we're together. Some tequila and. And, uh, and we'll have to avoid the, the, uh, the anomalous worms. So I want to wish everybody that and uh, tune in next time to uh, the Into the Impossible podcast with your fearful host, Dr. Brian Keating, and his, his friendly friend, uh, Eric. You're looking wonderful. Can't wait to we're in person. In all seriousness, miss you, buddy. Been too long. All right, brother. Best to everybody, all and right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks, Brian.